One of the most difficult questions facing Petro Poroshenko, which of course didn't face any other Ukrainian president, even though there's a strong similarity between the way in which Petro Poroshenko won in the first round to Lini Kravchuk, who won in the first round in 1991. At the same time, um, there, was, there were potential threats to Ukraine um, under Lini Kravchuk and under Lini Kuchma even. Um, Russia didn't sign a treaty with Ukraine recognizing the border until 1997. Um, at the same time, um, there wasn't military intervention and, and support for proxy wars as there is today. Ukraine um, uh, has an, an area of occupied territory, the Crimea. That was occupied in violation of both the Ukrainian-Russian uh, Treaty of 1997. It was also in violation, of course, of the 1995 Budapest Memorandum, where Ukraine was received security guarantees from the US, Britain, and Russia in return for giving up the world's third largest nuclear weapons. Um, the tearing up of that Budapest Memorandum inevitably is going to lead to nuclear proliferation and distrust of Western powers talking about the need to sort of back off from getting nuclear weapons. Um, so that, and, and the response of uh, both the US, Canada, and Europe has been pretty pathetic um, in, in relation to this massive violation of territorial integrity. This is the first major land grab um, by a foreign power since World War II. Now, um, the Crimea, um, how it's going to be returned, whether it should be returned, um, is a big open vex question, of course. The, um, there are some Ukrainians who will argue um, that good riddance to the Crimea, because it gets rid of the Black Sea Fleet problem, never mind just the Crimean problem. Uh, could one really see Ukraine integrating into Europe and NATO with Crimea inside Ukraine, and with the Black Sea Fleet inside Ukraine? I think it's difficult to believe. I was surprised in March when I was in Kiev that even nationalist self-defense forces on the Maidan and paramilitaries were not interested in fighting for the Crimea. They were interested in fighting in eastern Ukraine, but not in the Crimea. It's as though the Crimea doesn't fit into the Ukrainian consciousness as much, as, of course, as eastern Ukraine does. Now, the problem that Ukraine has, and this could, be, could have been the fault of the then acting president, uh, Turchinov, is that Ukraine didn't lift a finger to defend the Crimea, which sent a terrible signal out to the Western world. The West can't really criticize Russia for occupying the Crimea if the Ukrainians themselves are not willing to fight for the Crimea. And, and, and Mr. Turchinov, President Turchinov at the time, made, the, made it even worse. He, he not only didn't give the order for troops in the Crimea to defend their military bases, just defend, not attack, defend their bases. He didn't give the alternative order, which might have been strategically necessary, to do a strategic retreat, to bring the fleet, Ukrainian Navy, to Odessa and Ukrainian troops to Kherson. At least we wouldn't have lost any equipment and we wouldn't have lost face. So a strategic retreat might have been the right thing to do at the time. But he didn't do that and he didn't order them to defend their bases. So it was the worst of both worlds and I don't know to what degree Ukrainian equipment has been lost from the Crimea. But certainly Ukrainians are complaining that some of the equipment that was taken by the Russians and has been now given back has been deliberately destroyed. Uh, so it's, been, it's, been, it's been returned unworkable. Every Ukrainian leader from now on for, for decades to come is going to have to say, like P President Poroshenko, that the Crimea is ours, we demand it back. Um, but, you know, can we really see Ukrainian army attacking the Crimea and trying to take it back, especially when President Putin remains in power. And he's likely to want to stay in power for the rest of his life. So that is probably unlikely. Uh, another president, maybe Yuli Tymoshenko rather than Petro Poroshenko, might have been willing to organize paramilitary, OPA, sort of uh, guerrilla type groups to go into the Crimea and do assassin targeted assassinations guerrilla campaign against the occupation forces, which under international law, they would have a right to do. But that doesn't seem to be on the, on the cards for the time being either. 
Um, there is a parallel with a country that I know very well, Ireland, which um, had in its constitution for seven decades or more a territorial claim to Ulster in Northern Ireland, um, but nobody ever believed that this small Irish uh, country was going to invade, um, intervene into Ulster and fight the British over, over, over Northern Ireland. And eventually that was taken out of the Irish constitution after the uh, Good Friday Agreement between Tony Blair and, and the Irish leaders. Um, and today, Ireland no longer has a territorial claim to, to Ulster. And Ulster, in many ways, would have been inside Ireland, um, Ireland's uh, Donbass or Ireland's Crimea. Um, it's a region which is as xenophobic as is the Crimea. So the Crimea is um, a kind of closed entity for, for a while. Um, certainly, I don't see how the Crimea question can be somehow reopened as long as Vladimir Putin is leader of Russia. And he's, as I say, he's likely to want to stay around for quite a long time. Eastern Ukraine is a different matter. Um, there, the Ukrainians are willing to fight for East Ukraine. They do see um, the loss of East Ukraine, the loss of Donetsk and, and Luhansk, as potentially being a threat to the independence of Ukraine, which is not the way they see the Crimea. So they don't see the loss of the Crimea as a potentially a threat to the independence of Ukraine, whereas in East Ukraine they do. So that's an important distinction. And Ukrainians, of course, are fighting um, in Donetsk and Luhansk. Where Putin miscalculated, it would seem, is that he believed that the whole of Russian-speaking eastern and southern Ukraine, about eight regions, um, would all en masse, in huge numbers, uh, protest, do uprisings, call in the Russian army um, in March, uh, April, and Russian army would then intervene in, in defense of its brothers, and Putin then would have his so-called new Russia and a territorial corridor to Transnistria, Moldova, and to the Crimea. That didn't happen. He miscalculated. Um, the protests have been pretty miserable and, or have not really taken place in all of these regions except for the two of Donetsk and Luhansk. And, and there is a reason for that. Donetsk and Luhansk are different uh, from the rest of East Ukraine, like Galicia is different from the rest of Western Ukraine. Donetsk and Luhansk, together Donbass, have a similar national identity to the Crimea. Um, there's very little ethnic Ukrainian component in both of those places. Um, it's heavily Russified, but more importantly, heavily Sovietized. Um, Ukrainian surveys have, pr have shown that the, the, the more dominant national identity in the Crimea and Donetsk is actually Soviet, not Russian or Ukrainian. Um, and not surprisingly, therefore, both regions were the home base and the hardline home base of the party regions and communists, both in Donbass, Donetsk, and in the Crimea. Um, and so it's, again, not surprising that um, the violence has been restricted to those two regions and not really in places like, for example, Dnipropetrovsk, where I was just in May, um, Kharkiv or Zaporizhia, because these have old historical ties to Cossack Ukraine. And there's a large ethnic Ukrainian component in all of those uh, regions. Um, we have in Dnipropetrovsk, where I visited, uh, a Jewish-Ukrainian oligarch who's the governor of Dnipropetrovsk, running a Russian-speaking region, financing four battalions of Ukrainian nationalists to fight in Donetsk. Now, if that's not um, a multicultural Ukraine, I don't know what is. Um, the Donetsk and Luhansk, what happened? Well, you had a monopoly of power in Donetsk and Luhansk by the party of regions. The Communist Party was a satellite party. People joke that CPU actually stood for Capitalist Party of Ukraine. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't a communist party in defense of the proletariat if it's uh, tied to tycoons and oligarchs. With the collapse of those two political parties, and I don't see those two political parties reviving themselves, so we have a political vacuum in eastern and southern Ukraine. With the collapse of those two political parties in Donetsk and Luhansk, where there was previously a monopoly of power by, by them, then um, that enabled um, marginal Russian nationalist, extremist, pan-Slavic groups, which previously had uh, no support, or they were somehow linked to the party regions and communists, to crawl out from under their rocks and to take power. 
point, to, to grab power, as it were. They were helped in the initial stages by the Russian typical green men. If you watch the videos from late March, these are all identical guys with crisp green uniforms, very professional, taking over the buildings. Then they withdraw and pass the buildings over to these local extremists, um, who are partly at the time also supported by the Yanukovych and the family. This is not just Russia. Um, this is where the party regions begins to splinter into subgroups. <coughs> so the part, so the Yanukovych and the family are helping to uh, fund and provide financial and other support to these separatists as a way of pressurizing Kiev, as a way of revenge. Um, remember that in November 2004, there was also a separatist congress in Severodonetsk at the time as a way of attempting to pressure Kiev. Uh, Mr. Yefremov, the leader of the Party of Regions faction, who's from Luhansk, is under criminal investigation as we speak for being a supporter of um, separatism um, in, in his native oblast of Luhansk. And um, there's absolutely no doubt that he was backing this at the beginning. But as, the, as this backing took place, then of course Russia began to provide more additional resources, mercenaries, advisors, political leaders, um, even fascists from Russia, from the Russian Party of National Unity, where during their congresses they actually do the Hill Hitler salute, which you don't get of any Ukraine nationalist group doing. These came down to give a lending hand, and many of these uh, Russian advisors, Russian military intelligence officers have taken commanding positions in these various uh, paramilitary separatist groups. Now, the problem Ukraine has is manifold. Firstly, this is not terrorism in the sense that I remember in Northern Ireland or when the IRA would put bombs in mainland Britain. Um, there was only probably a few hundred active IRA members, despite, plus, of course, the far larger thousands of political supporters. So that's a small terrorist group. But according to Ukrainian um, official figures, there are around 10,000 um, so-called terrorists in Donetsk and Luhansk. That's more than terrorists. Now, we're talking now about a very large one could call it insurgency, separatism, we leave that up to the experts, but this is beyond merely terrorism. Yeah. It's also not completely true to say this is just a Russian-backed, fake, artificial phenomena. They do have some local support. Um, Donetsk, Luhansk has about 25 to 30 percent support for separatism, um, compared to sort of 10, 12 percent in the other Russian-speaking regions. So it is about double what you get elsewhere, but it's not a majority. And it's not as high as support for separatism in Scotland or Quebec, let's remember. So um, this, there is some local support, and there is some support besides Russia from Yanukovych and, and the family, particularly the organized crime figures in the Yanukovych family, such as Yuri Ivan Yushchenko, uh, a hired uh, killer, organized crime killer from the 1990s, who was a member of the Party of Regions, and the, one of the bagmen for the Yanukovych family. People like him have um, been found out to be fund providing some of the funding and infrastructure. Tetyana Chornovol, um, a Euromaidan activist who is now the head of the Anti-Corruption Bureau in the Ukrainian government, has written about this on her blog about how this funding comes from that group as well. So it's a mixture of Russian support and support locally. And the problem Ukraine has besides uh, having s there is some local support is that this, it's difficult to know who to negotiate with. There isn't a single Che Guevara um, running this whole uh, terrorist insurgency or whatever you want to call it. There are many, many leaders. Um, it's very anarchic. Um, there are many subgroups, Russian parliament, there's like a Russian Orthodox army, for example, and other groups. So there isn't one leader who could claim to represent everybody. And I think it also is the case that uh, Vladimir Putin himself could not turn this off like he could turn water off on a tap. Um, I somehow doubt that he is able to control all 10,000 of these insurgents and terrorists. He obviously controls some of them, particularly the ones who come from Russia. But, he, but I'd be surprised if he controls all of them. So it's, it's 
um, from a period where um, it received local support or apathy from oligarchs such as Rinder Akhmetov, who turned a blind eye, trying to sort of play off Russia, Ukraine, and initial Russian support, this has now uh, come out of its Pandora's box um, in, and, and received a life of its own. And therefore, it's going to be far more difficult to sort of put, put this genie back in the bottle, as it were. Another problem that Ukraine has is its own security forces. Um, the Ukrainian military was heavily underfunded. It received 15, 20% of its budgetary needs for the last 10, 15 years. Um, it was heavily downsized. It was trained to fight NATO, not to fight domestic counterinsurgency operations. The Ukrainian police is not really worth talking about. It's a massive monolith of 300,000 uh, police officers, but many of those have actually supported the terrorists and insurgents. And it's a pretty useless and corrupt institution. Ukraine did have a National Guard in the 1990s, but Kuchma, uh, President Kuchma closed that down in 2000, and Ukraine's had to relaunch a National Guard. Um, the security service of Ukraine, right, like the Ukrainian military, were heavily infiltrated by Russia during the Viktor Yanukovych era. And even today on Ukrainska Pravda, uh, there's a report um, from one of the military information uh, services that there could be even a Russian spy in the central headquarters of the anti-terrorist operation, which would explain why many operations are caught out as they're actually happening, because they the, the separatists receive advanced information. So Ukra Ukraine doesn't necessarily have the forces to, f to fight um, a coordinated approach to these terrorists. And it certainly hasn't used air power sufficiently. Um, there's also old cadres in power um, amongst these security forces. Only yesterday, finally, uh, there was the, the Euromaidan activists managed to force a resigna resignation of the commander of Ukraine's border guards. Who is the commander of Ukraine's border guards? He's been there forever. And it's the brother of Volodymyr Litvin, who was the snake and flip, he is, he's a person who could compete with Mr. Poroshenko to be Ukraine's most biggest flip-flopper um, in Ukrainian politics, the former speaker of the Ukrainian parliament um, and, um, and former head of President Kuchma's presidential administration, Volodymyr Litvin. His brother was the head of the border guards, and they were disastrous in maintaining control over Ukraine's eastern border with Russia. Uh, only yesterday you had the crossing of that border by three Russian tanks and um, armored personnel carriers coming into Ukraine. So uh, security forces are a major problem. So it's not just a question of, it, is a, it would be a good thing if Canada and the US supplied some military equipment specialist military equipment. It's great that the United States is now no longer just supplying military meals to the Ukrainian forces and some other things, but let's accept the fact that there is corruption. Some of this could be stolen. And, but more importantly than equipment, Ukraine needs advisors, Western advisors, needs, needs the Ukrainian diaspora, which is always asking people like me during talks, what should we do, what can we do to help? Well, you want to help? Pay, hire contractors. They exist, I'm sure, in every country. They exist certainly in Britain and the United States, who have used them in Iraq and Afghanistan. They used to be called soldiers of fortune, mercenaries. Now they're called contractors. These are professionals in counterinsurgency. They need to be hired not to do the fighting. Ukrainians will happily do the fighting, but the Ukrainians need concrete advice. And they need advice from these guys on the, on the counterinsurgency element. And they need advice from international organizations and Western governments on the political side. Because you can't just have a military side to the counterinsurgency. You need also political dialogue. And the round tables which have been held until now have been a joke. They're not, they haven't been serious. You need to reach out to the silent majority in Donetsk and Luhansk who have said, a plague in all your houses. We don't support the terrorists, but we also don't support Kiev. Those people need to be reached out to, because they're not all bad um, supporters of, of the terrorists. So Ukraine has um, a, a, a many, many issues to deal with in fighting this, um, this, this insurgency or terrorism in Donetsk and Luhansk. And um, it's going to be a major problem for P President Poroshenko 
Why? Because he came to power, the Ukrainian public preferred his approach to Yulia Tymoshenko's. Yulia Tymoshenko's approach was typically Tymoshenko, to the barricades. We're going to fight them all. We're going to win. That rhetoric people didn't want to hear. People were tired and fed up of crises, which had been going on since November. They wanted somebody like Petro Poroshenko, who was going to quieten things down, to bring back stability, to end crises. Well, if he can't end the separatist conflict in Donetsk, that's going to heavily impact upon his public uh, ratings. And he can either deal with this in two ways, or a mixture of two ways. One is trying to military, militarily defeat the terrorists. That's going to be extremely difficult uh, because of the reasons I've outlined. And certainly you would require some strong elements of Western input there, Western advisors behind the scenes, Western contractors. Um, or you could try and undertake some form of negotiations. Petro Poroshenko's tried to do both, which is not going to work. You either do one or the other. You can't do both. Um, and um, on negotiations, there I'm a bit not very hopeful. Why? Um, what can Petro Poroshenko offer to Russia that it will agree to back off? And I'm not sure he can offer very much. He already doesn't support NATO membership, so he, that made him different to Yuli Tymoshenko during the election campaign. So he can't put that on the table and take it off. He's not going to drop European integration. The last time a president did that, it led to a Euromaidan. Um, he, and he can't support federalism, which has no support amongst the Ukrainian public or amongst Ukraine's elites. Um, so what could he offer? Some kind of autonomous, um, self-governing status to Donetsk? Possibly. Um, but is that going to be enough today? We know that in all of these conflicts, the initial demands might be something like self-governance, autonomy, but once you have bloodshed, particularly of civilians, and you know if you're going to pursue a very radical uh, military campaign in this urban guerrilla environment, inevitably you're going to have civilian casualties. And once you have civilian casualties, demands grow beyond the initial uh, demands. So they'll grow towards separatism or independence. So, but if Ukraine doesn't do anything, it's also left in a quandary. So you, you, you're, you're, in some ways, you lose out both ways, whatever you do. You don't do anything or if you do something. Because if you don't do something, you're going to have this uh, Transnistria kind of uh, criminal enclave on your eastern border. Um, and, um, or you're going to have the region incorporated into Russia. But I think Vladimir Putin would far more prefer rather than incorporating Donetsk into Russia, into Russia, it far more preferred to keep it as a frozen conflict, similar to Transnistria, because that would be an, a pinpoint of pressure on, on Kiev, as it is in the case of Georgia with South Ossetia and in the case of Moldova with, with Transnistria. So um, the, the various options available to President Poroshenko are not very good. He does have strong public backing. I even saw this in Dnipropetrovsk. Strong public backing for taking a very tough hard line. But, um, but whether that hard line public support will hold up is another question. Just this week I watched, for example, a video from Western Ukraine. This is not Eastern Ukraine, but from Western Ukraine. You know, probably the most patriotic region of Ukraine. Where parents were lying under the buses to prevent them taking away their sons who were conscripts. Why were they doing that? Because they were angry that their sons were being trained for a miserable two weeks only and were given terrible equipment and they felt that their Western Ukraine sons were just basically cannon fodder. And so if this continues, if casualties continue to mount on the Ukrainian side, there is going to be a growing view that why should we want to die for this region that, that doesn't feel like ours speaks a different language, has a different mentality, is not interested in going to Europe, and wants to go to Russia, to hell with the region. So, um, like with domestic reforms, Petro Poroshenko needs to do a lot very quickly in his first and second year. He needs to pursue radical reforms, as well as pursue a, um, a policy of trying to 
um, at least subdue, if not be victorious, but it certainly constrain this, this conflict in Donetsk because um, that public support will not hold out longer than one to two years. Then he'll become unpopular very quickly, as was Lenin Krauchuk from 1993 onwards. So President Poroshenko, we wish him well, but he has a hell of a lot on his plate to deal with.